The Seven Voyages of Sindbad the Sailor From the Arabian Nights In the time of Harun al-Rashid, there was, in Baghdad, a rich merchant named Sindbad the Sailor, the source of whose wealth was a mystery. It seemed to be inexhaustible. For long seasons he kept open house, and his entertainments were the most magnificent of all, save only those of Er rashid himself. All that riches could buy seemed at his disposal, and he lavished the good things of this life upon his guests. Pages, slaves, and attendants there were in great number. His garden was spacious and beautiful, and his house was filled with every costly luxury. This Sinbad, the sailor, has a story to tell the story of his life, but he never told it to any, until one day there came to him one Sinbad the landsman, a man of poor and humble birth. This man pleased him greatly with an apt recitation, dealing with the widely different lots dispensed by God to men, and being pleased, he was struck with the happy conceit that now Sinbad the sailor was at last confronted with Sinbad the landsman, it would be no bad thing were he to narrate the story of his life, so that all might know his strange adventures and conjecture no longer as to the source of his fabulous wealth. Accordingly, Sinbad the sailor held seven receptions on seven different days, and, although on each occasion a multitude of guests was assembled to listen, he failed not to address his words from first to last to his simple listener, Sinbad the landsman. Following is his narration of the strange and wonderful adventures he experienced in his seven voyages. The First Voyage of Sinbad The Sailor My father was a merchant of high rank and rich possessions. He died when I was but a child, leaving me all his wealth. When I reached manhood's estate, I used my inheritance with no thought for the morrow, living in a sumptuous manner and consorting with the richest young men of Baghdad. I continued this life for many years until, at last, when reason prevailed with me to mend my plan, I found with dismay that I had sunk to poverty. And then it was that I arose and sold what goods remained to me for three thousand pieces of silver and girded myself, resolving to travel to other lands and rebuild my fortune by the wit of my mind and the labour of my hands. With a part of my hoard, I bought merchandise for exchange in far lands, and also such things as I should require in my travels. Thus prepared, I set sail with a company of merchants in a ship bound for the city of El Basra. For many days and nights we sailed upon the sea, visiting islands and passing thence to other islands, and everywhere we bartered and bought and sold. At length we came to an island unlike the others. It seemed like a garden that had floated from off the sides of paradise and established itself in the sea. And here our ship cast anchor and we landed. Then fires were lighted, and while some cooked, others washed in the cool stream, and yet others amused themselves admiring the beauties of the place. When all had eaten of the food prepared, the shore became a gay scene of sport and play, in which I engaged to the full. But suddenly, a cry from the master of the ship put an end to our gaiety. Standing at the side of the vessel, he called loudly, Hear me, and may God preserve you. Hasten back and leave everything. Save yourselves from sudden death, for this that ye think is an island is not such. It is a mighty fish lying entranced in sleep on the surface of the sea since times of old, and trees have grown upon it. But your fires and your frolicking have awakened it and lo, it moves, and if it sink into the sea, you will assuredly be drowned. Hasten then, and save yourselves. At this, we all, with one accord, left everything and fled for the ship, hoping to escape with our lives. While we were making for safety, the island moved with a great turmoil and sank behind us in the sea, and the waves leapt against each other above it. For a time I gave myself up as lost, for I was drawn down fathoms deep. But by God's grace I rose again to the surface, and to my hand was one of the large wooden bowls which some of the passengers had taken on shore for the purpose of washing. This I seized and established myself in it, and thus combated the leaping waves, steadying myself with my hands and feet. 
In vain I called on the master of the ship. He heard me not. He had spread his sails and pursued his way, thinking that none beside those who had been taken up were left alive. Astride my wooden bowl, I gazed longingly at the ship until it was out of sight. Then I prepared for death as the night was closing around me. Perchance I swooned, for I remembered naught else until I found myself stranded upon a mountainous island. There were trees overhanging, and I grasped a drooping bough and drew myself up from the fretting wave. My limbs were benumbed, and on looking at my legs I saw the marks made by the nibbling teeth of fish and marvelled at my salvation from death. Staggering forward, I flung myself high on the beach like one dead, and so I remained until the dawn of the next day, when the sun, rising upon me, woke me to a sense of such a condition as I had never known before. Long, long it was before I could rise to a sitting posture, and longer still before I could crawl on my hands and knees to a space of grass that was shielded from the sun. Thence, in time, I staggered till I came to a brook of which I drank, and strength returned to me. I found luscious fruits and ate of them, and drank again of the clear waters of the brook. And so I continued many days roaming the island, and wondering at its beauties until I was strong again as before. And it chanced, as I took my way to and fro in the island, revelling in the sight of things that God had set there, that on a day when the sea was sounding loudly on the shore, I beheld something in the distance which excited my curiosity. It seemed like a wild animal of gigantic size, and as I approached, I feared it was some fabulous beast of the sea. But, as I drew still nearer, I was overcome with amazement to see a beautiful mare standing high, with mane and tail floating on the breeze. She was tethered to a stake on the shore, and at sight of me she screamed loudly and stamped her forefeet on the sand. But ere I turned to flee, I beheld a man come forth from a cave nearby, and he ran after me, calling on me to give an account of myself and my presence in that place. Thereupon I laid my story before him, sparing no detail, even to the wooden bowl by means of which, and the grace of God I had come thither. Gladness seized him at my recital, and he took my hand, saying, Come with me. He led me into his cave and set food before me. I ate until I was satisfied, and being at my ease, I repeated my story more minutely, and he wondered thereat. Then I said, Thou hast the truth of my adventures upon the sea. Now I pray thee, O my master, tell me who thou art, that thou dwellest hidden in a cave while thy mare is tethered on the shore. He was in no way displeased at my curiosity, but answered me in plain words. I am one of the grooms of the King El Mirage he said, and the others are scattered about the island. For look you, friend, it is the time of the new moon when the seahorse cometh up out of the sea, and it is our plan to bring our best mares hither and tether them by the shore so that they may lure the seahorses into our hands. While I was wondering at the manner of this cunning device, a magnificent seahorse rose from the waves, shaking the foam from its crest and neighing loudly. As it approached, my companion drew me into the cave and placed himself at the opening with a long coil of thick cord in his hand. Presently, by means of this, he leashed the seahorse with great dexterity and fettered him and subdued him. Then, with the mare and the seahorse, he led me to his companions, who, when they had heard my story, were all of one mind that I should accompany them to the city of the king. So they mounted me on one of the mares, and I rode with them to the king's palace. As soon as we had arrived at the palace gates, they went in to the king and informed him of my strange adventures, whereupon he sent for me, and they led me before him. He greeted me very courteously, and bade me tell him my story, which, when he had heard it, filled him with amazement, so that he cried, By Allah, my son, of a truth thou art favoured by fate for how else couldst thou escape so great a peril? Praise God for thy deliverance. And he made much of me, and caused me to be treated with honour, and he appointed me master of the harbour and comptroller of the shipping. My condition then was no longer that of a wayfarer. 
I rose day by day to a higher and a higher place in the king's favour, and he took me into his counsel in all affairs of state. For a long time I served him well, and he ceased not to recompense me with a liberal hand. Yet my thoughts turned ever to Baghdad, the abode of peace. But when I inquired of merchants and travellers and masters of ships in which direction it lay, and how one might come at it, they one and all shook their heads at the name of a strange city of which they had never heard. At last, weary of the wonders of that island and the sea around it, wonders the which, if I had time to tell you, would cause you the greatest amazement, wearied too with my arduous duties, but most of all with my prolonged absence from my own land, I stood one day on the seashore when a great ship drew near and a number of merchants landed from it. The sailors brought forth their merchandise, and when I had made an account of it, I inquired of the master of the ship if that were the whole of his cargo. All, oh my master, he replied, all save some bales whose owner was drowned on our voyage hither, but even these being in my charge, I desire to sell on behalf of his family in Baghdad. Sayest thou so, I cried, tell me, I pray thee, the name of the owner of these goods. And he replied, his name was Sinbad the sailor, and he was drowned on our way hither. When I heard this, I regarded him more closely and recognized him. Then I cried out, O oh my master, I am he, and they are my goods that are in thy hold. But he neither recognized me nor believed my words, whereupon I narrated to him the history of my supposed death. But he shook his head and called upon Allah to witness that there was neither faith nor conscience in any. Look you, he said, thou heardst me say the owner was dead, and therefore thou desirest the goods for thyself free of price. I tell thee we saw him sink into the sea with many others. Oh, my master, I answered, hear me and then judge of my veracity. With this, I narrated to him many trivial things which happened before we reached the great fish island, and which could never be known to me had I not been on the ship. And then it was that he and many of the merchants regarded me with fixed looks and recognized me. By Allah, said they one and all, we truly believed thee drowned, but here we find thee alive. And they pressed upon me and congratulated me, and the master of the ship gave me my goods, at sight of which I was overjoyed, and they all rejoiced with me. Mindful of the king I served, I at once opened my bales, and, selecting the most costly articles, went into him and laid them at his feet, telling him how I had regained the goods of which they were a part. And the king wondered greatly at my good fortune and graciously accepted my gifts. He also showed me great favour and honour in that he bestowed upon me gifts in return for mine. Then, having sold my remaining goods at a profit, I bought largely of the merchandise of the city, and when the ship was about to sail, I approached the king and thanked him for his great kindness to me, and humbly begged his leave to depart to my own city and family. So he gave me his blessing, and a great wealth of merchandise and rare commodities, and bade me farewell. And soon thereafter, having stowed all my goods in the hold of the ship, I set sail with the others for Baghdad. Our voyage was fortunate, and with the aid of favourable winds, we reached the city of El Basra in safety. Thence I repaired to Baghdad, and my family and my friends gave me a joyous welcome. And when I had sold my merchandise, I set up a large establishment, sparing no cost, and I bought land and houses and gathered round me wealthy companions, in whose society I soon forgot the dangers and terrors I had suffered in other lands. Such is the story of my first voyage. And tomorrow, by God's grace, I will narrate to you the strange adventures of my second voyage. The Second Voyage of Sindbad, the Sailor As I related yesterday, I was living here in Baghdad in the midst of every delight, surrounded by companions after my own heart. But a time came when the wandering spirit seized me again, and I longed for the sight, even for the perils, of other and unknown lands. This, and the fact that I had decreased my substance by large expenditure, led me to adventure a second journey, at once to relieve the monotony of life and to replenish my exhausted store. The step was quickly taken. 
Having collected suitable merchandise, I repaired to the river, and without a word to anyone, embarked on a new ship finely rigged and manned by a large crew. Together with a goodly party of merchants I sailed away, and we passed over the deep from island to island and from sea to sea, with fair winds filling the sails. And at every place at which we cast anchor, we bought and sold and bartered. So we continued until we came to an uninhabited island of great beauty. The trees hung with ripe fruits, birds of bright plumage flew hither and thither over the shining foliage, and their songs were heard in the topmost branches. Rare flowers laid their scent upon the breeze, and pure clear streams coursed everywhere. When we landed, we fell to extolling these master touches of the Creator's hand, for indeed the place was, as it were, born of fragrant musk, so fresh and beautiful and full of all delights not made by man. Selecting a rare spot on the bank of a stream, I sat apart, meditating upon the wonderful works of the Omnipotent One. There the soft zephyrs singing in the trees, and the stream murmuring at my feet, lulled me to slumber. And when I awoke later, I looked forth upon the sea, and lo, the ship was far out on the wall of the ocean, sloping to the sky. They had forgotten me, and I was left alone upon the island. Despair fell upon me as I gazed around and realized that I was desolate. And I said within myself, What if I escaped from dangers in the past, when all seemed lost? It still remains that here, at least, there is no escape. Then I blamed myself for leaving my comfortable life in Baghdad to undertake this voyage, for here there was neither strong food, nor strong drink, nor rich apparel, nor gold, nor goods. As I pondered to the point of madness on these things, a restless spirit came upon me, and I ran to and fro in the island, retracing my steps and crossing them, but I found naught to lessen my despair. At last I climbed to the top of a high tree, and looking forth in every direction, saw only sky and sea and trees and watercourses. As I gazed, however, my eye reverted again and again to an object in a distant part of the island. It was round and white and of enormous size. This aroused my curiosity, and I resolved to find out what it was. Having marked its position, I descended from the tree and made my way towards it. When I reached it, I found to my astonishment that it was a gigantic dome, white and shining. My first thought was to walk round it to ascertain if there were some door or opening, but none could I find in its whole circumference, which was about fifty paces. While I was meditating on some means to gain an entrance to this strange structure, behold, the sky darkened and on looking towards the sinking sun, I saw it was hidden by a great black cloud, an unwonted thing, as it was the summer season. While I continued to gaze, the object drew rapidly nearer, and now I could discern in it the shape of a monstrous bird approaching swiftly through the air, and this it was that blotted out the sun. Marvelling greatly, I recalled a story told by travellers about certain islands where was found a bird of immense size called the Ruch, which fed its young on elephants. It was then I knew that the great white dome I had discovered was one of this bird's eggs, at which, not the least of the creator's works, I wondered greatly. Then, while I so wondered, the giant bird alighted over the egg, and crouching down, spread its wings and brooded over it, and composed itself to sleep. Here, thought I, was a chance of escaping from the island. Unfolding my turban, I twisted it into a rope, and bound one end of it tightly about my waist. Then I approached the great bird cautiously, and fastened the other end securely to one of its feet. For thus, when it flew away, it might perchance bear me through the air to some inhabited region. The whole night long I lay awake thinking of my projected flight, but it was not until morning that the bird awoke, and with a loud cry rose from the egg, bearing me aloft. Higher and higher it soared, until I thought it must reach the stars. Then, gradually, in vast circles, it descended, and finally came to earth on a high tableland. 
In great fear, lest the bird should discover my presence, I made haste to loose the turban from its foot, and having done so, I crept away, trembling in every limb. Then, as I watched the bird from a distance, I observed it pick something from the ground and soar away with it clutched in its talons, and I looked again and saw that it was an enormous serpent twisting and writhing in the grasp of the bird as it flew swiftly towards the sea. And at this strange thing I wondered greatly as I folded my turban. But what desert place had I come to by this daring misadventure? On the one side of the tableland was a deep valley, and on the other a steep mountain which no foot of man could climb. Had I only remained in the island, I should at least have had fruit to eat and water to drink, but here was nothing but desolation from which I had no hope of escape. There was no course but to descend into the valley, and this I did, little caring whither I went. Now I had not walked therein but a few furlongs when I observed that the ground I trod was strewn with diamonds of large size, but, and this gave me cause for wild alarm, coiled here and there amongst the stones were gigantic serpents, such as the one I had seen the bird bear away in its talons. As soon as I was aware of these sleeping serpents, which were of the same hue as the ground whereon they lay, I stepped warily lest I should awaken them and be devoured. In this way was I proceeding down that valley, my flesh quaking and my knees a-tremble, when suddenly the flayed carcass of a slaughtered beast fell with a great noise before me. This aroused great wonder in my mind, and also called to my recollection a story I had heard in my youth from a merchant traveller who had visited lands whence none else had ever come to deny the truth of it, a story confirmed by others who claimed a reputation for wide knowledge and feared to lose it. It was this, that in a far land, where diamonds are as thickly strewn as the venomous serpents and other deadly perils which render it difficult to come at them, the daring merchants who seek these precious stones employ a cunning stratagem. They take a beast and slaughter it on the heights above the valley, and having skinned it and lacerated the flesh, they throw it down. And when it reaches the bottom of the valley whereon the diamonds lie, the stones adhere to the moist flesh. From the depths of the sky descends the watching vulture of the giant kind, and this bird, seizing the carcass in its talons, soars with it to the mountain tops. whereupon the merchants spring out and frighten the bird away with loud cries, and then take the stones adhering to the meat and bear them to their own country. I had my whole life long regarded this story with a half-shut eye. But now, beholding the slaughtered beast before me, and guessing full well the meaning of its presence there, I said within myself, By Allah, no marvel is past belief, for here is the verification. I surveyed that carcass, and having measured in a glance the distance to the mountains whence it had descended, I gazed into the blue sky, in whose depths lurked the watching vulture. A plan of escape then came to me, and I hastened to put it into operation. First, I gathered as many diamonds as I could well dispose within my garments. Then, unfolding my turban, I approached the slaughtered beast, and lying on my back, drew it over me and bound myself firmly to it. I had not lain long in that position, with the heavy weight of the beast upon me, when a monstrous vulture came out of the sky, and seizing upon the carcass with a loud scream, gripped it in its powerful talons, and rose up and away with it and me. And it rose higher and higher, with a mighty flapping of its wings, until at last it alighted on a broad ledge near the summit of the mountain, a place which, judging by the bleached bones lying on every hand, was the favourite feeding place of these birds. This was clearly known to the merchant who had cast the carcass down, for, no sooner had the vulture deposited his burden and started to tear at the flesh than he sprang out with loud cries and scared it away. Half smothered by the weight of the slaughtered beast, I lost no time in freeing myself, and soon I struggled to my feet and stood there with my clothes stained and polluted with its blood. When the merchant saw me, his fear was great but his disappointment was even greater when his fear mastered by the lust of gain, he turned the carcass over and found no diamonds sticking to the flesh. 
pitying him in his sad case, for he was smiting hand on hand and calling out against fate. I advanced and said, Curse not fate, nor fear me, for I am of thy kind, and I hear with me an abundance of these stones the loss of which thou lamentest, and they are of the largest that a man can carry upborne by a vulture's wings. Of these will I give unto thee, therefore forget thy fear and bury thy disappointment. On hearing this, the merchant thanked me, and prayed fervently for me and my family, and he ceased not to pray for the prolongation of my life, until I had bestowed upon him the largest diamonds I could find within my garments. While he was thanking me for this, there came his companions, each of whom had cast down a carcass, and when they had heard the story of my escape, they congratulated me and bade me come with them, for they said, By Allah! Thou art greatly favoured by fate, since none but thee hath been in that valley and escaped to tell the tale. After my perilous adventures and my despairing sojourn in the Valley of Serpents, I was filled with the utmost joy at finding my fellow mortals around me, and seeing this, they made me welcome among them, and I partook of their food and wine. We passed the night in a safe place, and when morning came, we set forth over the mountain ranges overlooking the valley of the serpents, and at length descended to a stretch of sea. This we crossed by means of the boats which they had moored by the shore, and came thus to a low-lying island where grew camphor trees in abundance, each of which might shield a hundred men from the sun. Here, too, upon the plains roamed the wild rhinoceros, of which wonderful tales are told by people who return from unknown lands. This beast impales an elephant upon its horn with ease, and wanders thus with little hindrance to its pasturing, until the fat of the elephant, melting in the heat of the sun and flowing down into its eyes, renders it blind. Whereupon it seeks the seashore, and lies down until such time as the ruch may find it, and carry both it and the elephant away as a morsel for its young. But I speak of what I know, and, as I saw naught of this kind, I can but say that I know not. I continued with my companions for some space, journeying from island to island and exchanging the diamonds we had acquired for rich merchandise, and in passing through many countries unheard of in this city, I separated from them and went my way, coming at length to El Basra with a princely cargo of goods. Thence I journeyed to Baghdad, the abode of peace, and rejoined my family. Wealth I had in abundance, and I resorted to my former life of luxury, bestowing gifts and alms, wearing rich apparel, and eating and drinking with my companions. This is the story of my second voyage, and by the grace of God, whose name be exalted, I will narrate tomorrow the still more remarkable adventures that befell me on my third voyage. The Third Voyage of Sindbad The Sailor Having rested for a space in Baghdad, where I lived surrounded by every happiness and delight, I began again to experience that restless desire for travel and commerce which had drawn me forth on my former voyages. When the desire grew so great that I could no longer withstand it, I set out with a large stock of merchandise, and arrived at the city of El Basra, where I took ship, together with a goodly company of merchants and others of high standing and repute. For many days we sailed outwards, buying and selling among the islands, until, one day, while we were in the midst of the ocean, a storm descended upon us and blew the ship out of its course. The wind continued from one quarter with great violence, and for a day and night we were hurled before it. When morning came, it abated, and the master of the ship looked forth on every hand to ascertain where we were. Suddenly he uttered a loud cry and plucked his beard. God preserve us, he said. The gale hath driven us to an evil fate. See, yonder is the mountain of apes. None hath ever come near it and escaped. We looked and beheld a high mountain on an island, and while we were gazing at it and wondering where lay the danger at so great a distance, behold, the sea around us was swarming with apes which had swum out from the island. They were hideous black beasts, not of large size, but of malignant aspect and so great was their number that we were powerless to stand against them. 
They climbed up the sides of the ship and seized upon the ropes, which they severed with their sharp teeth so that the sails were powerless and the vessel drifted with tide and wind to the shore. There we were seized by the apes and set on the land, after which they returned to the ship and bent fresh ropes and set the sails and departed over the sea, we knew not whither. But we ceased to wonder at the manner of their going, for we were in a desperate plight, since all sailors feared the mountain of apes, and no ship would ever approach the island to rescue us. In our wanderings through the island, eating of its fruits and drinking of its streams, we came at length to an open space in which stood a house of gigantic size. The walls and the folding doors of ebony were very lofty, and when we walked into an immense apartment, for the doors were open, we found everything within it of a corresponding size. The cooking utensils were large enough to cook an ox whole, and on the couch at the upper end a hundred men might sit with comfort. But no occupant could we find, so we seated ourselves and rested for a while, and then we slept. It was about sunset when we were awakened suddenly by a loud noise and a trembling of the earth, and lo, we beheld coming from the further end of the apartment a gigantic being in the shape of a man. His skin was black, and his eyes blazed like fire. Two gleaming tusks protruded from his great mouth, his enormous ears drooped to his shoulders, and his nails were like the sharp claws of a beast of prey. We were stricken with great fear at the approach of this frightful being, so that we could neither move nor cry out, while he advanced to the couch and disposed his huge limbs thereon. Then, on turning his head, he caught sight of us, and arose and came towards us. As I was nearest to his hand, he seized me, and taking me from the ground, turned me over and over in his palm, feeling my limbs to see if they were fat. But by the grace of God, whose name be exalted, I was lean and wasted with fatigue and affliction. So he set me down and seized another, whom he turned over and felt in the same manner. He too was lean, and he let him go, but he took one after another until he came to the master of ship, a big man and fat. With him he was satisfied. Then, seeing what he was about to do, we hid our eyes, and did not look again until the ogre, having cooked and eaten our master, threw his bones upon a heap of others on one side of the apartment. Afterwards he arose and laid himself down upon the couch and slept, and his snoring was like the roll of thunder. We crept forth from that house in terror, feeling that it were happier to be killed by apes or drowned in the sea than to be roasted on live coals, a terrible death for a man. We then considered means of hiding or escaping from the place, but there was no place to hide and the ship, our only way of escape, was gone. While we were lamenting, a spell seemed to be cast over us, so that our very excess of fear drew us back to the ogre's house, wherein we sat as before, and slept. Again we were awakened by the thunder of the ogre's approach, and again he came and selected one of our number. When, having eaten, he slept upon the couch, we conversed together, thinking to find some way of escape, one said, By Allah, by Allah, let us kill him. And he proposed a plan. Listen, O oh my brothers, I said on hearing this. If we seek to kill him, let us first prepare some rafts on which to escape, for we may fail of our purpose. And on these rafts we can at worst be drowned, which is better than being roasted. They answered me, Thou art right. So we set to work and gathered stout pieces of wood and carried them to the seashore, where we constructed rafts and stowed food upon them in readiness for a hasty departure. Then we returned to the giant's house to carry out our plan. The sound of his snoring told us he still slept, so we took two sharp-pointed iron spits and heated the points red-hot in the fire. Then we approached him cautiously, and, at a given signal, thrust the red-hot points one into each of his eyes, and bore upon the spits with our combined weight. He arose with a mighty roar, and we fled right and left, for, his sight being destroyed, we feared his blind rage. He searched for us, but not finding us, he groped for the door and went forth uttering loud cries which shook the earth. 
In great haste, and lashed by mortal fear, we gained the seashore and launched the rafts, but scarcely had we gained the water when we saw the ogre approaching, led by a female more gigantic and more hideous than himself. We swam out, pushing the rafts before us, but they hurled great rocks after us, and many of our number were killed. Three alone, including myself, escaped, and after much stress and peril reached another island. We had gained at length what seemed to us a place of safety, high and dry above the wave and far from the ogre's domain, and there, when night came on, we slept, but only to awaken to fresh terrors. Lo, in the act of coiling round us was a serpent of enormous size, its folds contracting and its head raised to strike. At sight of this, another and myself were more nimble than our companion, for we sprang clear of the serpent's embrace, while he was seized in the huge jaws and slowly swallowed with a horrible crackling of bones. And we mourned our companion, and went thenceforth in fear for ourselves. Dreading to sleep again on the ground, we climbed a high tree, and binding ourselves each in a safe position with our turbans, we slept fitfully. But alas, God hath given to all serpents the wisdom of the evil one. That night the serpent mounted the tree, and seizing my companion, proceeded to swallow him, while I looked on in helpless fear. Then, in descending the tree, it coiled its vast bulk round the trunk, and I heard my companion's bones crack within its paunch. When morning had come, I descended from the tree, feeling that my safest course was to drown myself in the waves, for where else could I hide that the serpent could not find me? But life is sweet, and I pondered long upon a cunning plan to protect myself. Then, repairing to the seashore, I selected some pieces of wood from the raft and took them to a dry place. Towards evening, when I had eaten of the fruits of the island and drunk of its streams, I bound a long piece of wood crosswise upon the soles of my feet and another crosswise upon my head. I secured a wide, flat piece to my right side, another to my left side, and another to the front of my body. And there, having thrust my arms under the side pieces, I lay encased. And as the evening wore on, the serpent saw me and drew near, but it could not swallow me because of the pieces of wood. All through the night it tried to come at me, attempting in all ways to effect its purpose, but in every way it failed, while I lay like a dead man, gazing in speechless horror at the terrible creature. And it ceased not in its efforts to engulf me till morning broke, when it went its way consumed with rage and vexation. Then I freed myself from the pieces of wood and arose, trembling in every limb, but thanking God for my deliverance. For look you, I was sorely tried by what I had endured from that serpent. Not many hours later, I had the good fortune to espy a ship far out upon the sea, and as it was making as if to pass a headland of the island somewhat closely, I ran with all speed and established myself on the furthest point. There I waved my unfolded turban to attract the notice of those on the vessel. At last they saw me and came and took me on board. They listened to my story with great astonishment and congratulated me on my escape. Then they gave me clean raiment and set food and drink before me so that I was revived and comforted. And as we proceeded on our way, I was emboldened to look back on all I had suffered as nothing more than a terrible dream. In the course of our journey, we came to an island where the sandalwood grows, and here I landed with the other merchants. But they had goods to sell, while I, alas, had none. Then, strange to relate, the same kind providence that had befriended me on my first voyage was at my service once more, and in the same guise. The master of the ship, seeing me without merchandise, came to me, and taking compassion upon my poor condition, told me of some goods in the hold, which belonged to a man whom they had lost during the voyage. He offered me these goods to sell upon the island, so that, when an account had been rendered to the owner's family in Baghdad, there would be a recompense for my trouble and service. I thanked him gladly for this, and he ordered the goods to be brought up and landed on the island. And lo, 
When I saw the bales, I knew them, and showed how they were marked with the name of Sindbad, the sailor. Then, seeing that they were perplexed, I shouted in my excitement, Do you not hear me? I am Sinbad the sailor, and these are my goods. While some believed and others doubted, I related my story from the time I had awakened upon the island to find myself alone. And when I mentioned the Valley of Diamonds, a merchant came forward and confirmed my words, for it was he whose slaughtered beast had helped me to safety. Hear me, ye doubters, he said. When I related this very thing to you, you believed me not. But see, this is the man I spoke of, and now you have it independently from his own mouth. Learn from this, O oh my brothers, never while living, doubt a true tale, because it is marvellous. Then the master asked me what was the distinguishing mark of my goods, and I replied that it was such and such a mark, and I also called to his mind some conversation between him and me before the ship left El Basra. He was then convinced that I was Sinbad the sailor, and he congratulated me and embraced me, saying that my story was most extraordinary. The remainder of this, my third voyage, was occupied in buying and selling among the islands on the way to El Basra, whence, in good time, laden with wealth and rich merchandise, I proceeded to Baghdad to dwell in peace again, surrounded by my family and friends. Here, for a season charmed with every delight, I forgot the perils and horrors I had endured. But the longing for travel and adventure found me out again, impelling me to undertake a fourth voyage, and the events of this, more marvellous than those of the preceding voyages, O oh Sinbad, the landsman, I will narrate to you tomorrow. The Fourth Voyage of Sinbad The Sailor, led by the desire to associate with other races, and to buy and sell for gain, for the soul is prone to evil, I departed from Baghdad with many precious bales, and set sail from El Basra in a large ship on which a company of other merchants embarked in like fashion. For many days we had a pleasant journey among the islands, and all went well with us until, on reaching the wider sea beyond, a mighty wind came up against us. The sea rose in great waves as the tempest increased, and we were in dire peril. More and more violent grew the gale, lashing the sea into fury. The sails were rent, the masts were blown away, we sprang a leak, and slowly the vessel began to sink. We gave ourselves up for lost, and indeed when the waves passed over us and we sank, many perished. But in the seething turmoil it was my good fortune to be cast against a broad plank which I seized and held. Others were struggling for life nearby and I was able to draw some of them to me. Sore buffeted as we were by wind and wave, we mounted that plank and sat astride of it. Thus, through a whole day and night, we drifted before the gale, now descending into despairing hollows of the sea, and now flung up on the mountain tops of billows. At dawn on the following day, the sea cast us like dead men upon an island, where, for many hours, we lay exhausted. Albeit, strength began to return to us again, and we arose feebly and staggered forth into the island. Fruit and herbs there were in abundance and clear fresh water, so we ate and drank and were revived. That night we slept upon the shore, and in the morning we arose strengthened and invigorated. When we had broken our fast, we set ourselves to explore the island, and had not gone far in this before we came to a great building. As we stood at the door of this, wondering who dwelt within, a party of naked men came out, and without a word seized us and led us into a spacious apartment where we found ourselves standing before their king. He commanded us to be seated, and they brought us food of a strange kind, such as we had never seen. My companions ate largely of this, but my stomach revolted at it, and I ate but little, a thing which preserved me from a terrible fate. For, as my companions ate, they became mad with a ravenous hunger, and ate more and more. Presently they were given coconut oil to drink, and when they had swallowed it, their eyes rolled in their heads, and they continued to eat in a frenzy horrible to behold. 
I was consumed with fear at these things, and said within myself, This is a tribe of the Magi, and their king is a ghoul. As I observed them attentively, I remembered a story of these people, how they seize on travellers and set this loathsome food before them to eat, and give them the oil to drink, so that they swell out, and eat more and more until they are fattened to an enormous degree, and their minds are rendered like those of idiots whereupon, in due time, they kill and roast them and serve them up as food to their king. And all these things I saw in the days that my companions were fattening, for there were others who had been seized before us, and each day one of these was killed and roasted and set before the king. While I was wasting away with fear and hunger, and it was on this account that they forgot me and left me to die in my own way, my companions had come to be like dull, heavy, stupid beasts of the field, so that they were placed in the care of a beasted who led them forth every day to the pasturage. As for myself, as soon as I observed that I was a failure in that, I would not fatten, and that none took heed of me, nor marked my coming or my going, I arose in the night and crept away among the trees surrounding the king's dwelling. Then, when morning came, I went forth with a heart of fear knowing not what fresh terror I should encounter. In my wanderings back and forth I came about midday to a stretch of green pasture, where I beheld with sorrow my late companions grazing on all fours and fattening like beasts for the slaughter, while the beast had sat upon a rock and piped on an oaten reed. I breathed a silent farewell to them as to those I should never see again, and turned sadly away. My heart was cold within me, and my steps were faltering as I wandered on, pausing here and there to gather edible herbs and roots, which, for want of something better, served to sustain life in my body. Journeying in this way, I came at length to a grove of pepper trees, and there were men at work in it, gathering the berries. Their aspect seemed to me to be peaceable, so I exposed myself, and they approached me and pressed upon me, asking my name and whence I had come, for my aspect excited their curiosity. Then I unfolded to them the tale of the adventures, the perils and the horrors that had befallen me, and when I had related the sad case of my companions, they wondered greatly at my escape. While they resumed their work, they made me welcome amongst them and set nutritious food before me, the like of which I had not tasted for many days. I regaled myself on their bounty and rested, and was content. When they had finished their work at the setting of the sun, they took me with them to the seashore, and I accompanied them in their vessel to an island, not far distant, where they brought me to their king. And there, before them and his court, at his command I narrated my adventures since leaving Baghdad, at which his interest was kindled, and he bade me sit with him and eat. And I did so gladly, for my body was thin and meagre, and my vigour was sorely wanting. After that, having shown my gratitude to the king and offered praise to God for his saving grace, I rose, and with the king's permission, went forth into his city. It was a well-conditioned, flourishing place, thronged with buyers and sellers, and there was an abundance of food and rich merchandise. As day followed day and time drew on, I had cause to rejoice at my arrival in that city, for I found favour with the king and he magnified me over his people and his great men. Observing the ways of the people, I saw that the horses that they rode were without saddles, whereupon I went into the king and spoke to him on the matter, describing a saddle and the ease and comfort of it. At this the king desired me to make him one, and placed at my disposal his cleverest carpenter with many tools and instruments and I sat with the carpenter and instructed him how to proceed, so that the saddle, covered with polished leather and stuffed with teased wool, was soon complete. I attached stirrup straps and girths, and showed the blacksmith how to fashion the stirrups. Then, with the aid of costly fringes and trappings, the work was complete. Full of satisfaction I sent for one of the king's finest horses, saddled and bridled him, and led him before his majesty. He was greatly pleased at the sight of what I had done, and when he had mounted the horse and sat in the saddle, he was overjoyed at the ease and pleasure of it, and bestowed upon me a large reward. 
When the king's chief officials and the grandees of his court saw the saddle which I had made, they each and all desired me to make others like it. Then, with the carpenter and the blacksmith, I employed many days in the construction of numerous saddles, and for these I received much gold and rose to an assured position in the land. The high rank and honour which the king had bestowed upon me had but half expressed his heart towards me. I was yet to learn that he had a further favour in store. One day, while I was sitting at his right hand discussing affairs of state, he said to me, O oh my son, seeing thou hast now become as one of us, and we cannot part with thee, I desire that thou give ear to a matter which I have planned, and which will bind thee more closely to us. And I answered him, For thy great kindness to me, O king, I am now and henceforth thy faithful servant. What dost thou desire me to do? And he looked at me intently and said, I would marry thee to a woman of high rank among us, one possessed of great beauty and wealth, so that thou mayest continue to dwell with us in pleasure and comfort, and with a good heart. Thus shalt thou advantage greatly, and receive every good thing at my hands. Wherefore, refuse me not, nor oppose my wish. I remained silent, for I was overwhelmed by his proposal and the stress of bashfulness it brought to my face. Seeing this, he rallied me and said, Art thou dumb? Is not thy heart with us? Then of a sudden I replied, O king, thy words took away my breath. As thou commandest, so I obey. Pleased at my compliance, the king immediately ordered his officials to bring the lady and the witnesses and forthwith I was married to her with the king's blessing and the acclamation of all his court. She was of surpassing loveliness, and she brought me a dowry of abundant wealth and possessions, and to this the king added a magnificent house with servants and slaves, and assigned me a handsome salary, and I lived in ease and comfort, our days being full of delights. Gone was all thought of the perils and hardships I had endured, and gone was the fear of adversities in store. But there is no strength nor power but in God, and he orders the fates of men as he will. On an evil day a great fear suddenly came to me by reason of a thing which I will make known to you. A companion of mine suffered a bereavement in that his wife died, whereupon I went to him and mourned with him, saying, Take heart, O brother, God will fill her place to thee with one far better but he continued to weep, saying, Alas, how can I marry another when this very day I depart this life? Nay, said I, that is not within reason, for thou art in good health, and not like to die. He then raised his head and dried his tears, and said to me very slowly, Hear me, O my brother, knowest thou not that today they will bury my wife, and that they will bury me also in the same tomb with her? for such is our custom. When husband or wife is buried, the other must be buried also, so that neither may continue to enjoy life alone. By Allah, said I, smiting palm on palm, this custom is wholly vile, and it toucheth me closely. Then, as we continued to discuss this matter, there came others who condoled with my companion, grieving not only for the loss of his wife, but also that they should never see him more. And later in the day came yet others bearing a bier, and on this they laid the woman and carried her forth prepared for burial with all her jewels and raiment and wealth. And the husband went with them. Through sympathy with my companion, and to bid him a last farewell, I followed this funeral procession till it halted in a distant spot on the seashore. There a great stone was lifted, and a vault exposed. Into this they threw the body of the woman, and then, by means of a stout cord, they lowered the husband gently till he rested by her side. A pitcher of water and seven cakes were then let down to him, and when he had freed himself from the cord, they drew it up and closed the sepulchre and went their ways. By Allah, said I within myself as I smote myself on my breast, this manner of death is the worst of all and on my return I went in to the king with grief and fear gnawing at my heart. O king, I said, tell me why is this, that ye bury the living with the dead? Said he, 
O oh my son, it is the custom of our country and has descended to us from our ancestors. Husband and wife are one in death as in life. And I answered him with a question that concerned me nearly. O oh my lord, I said, and the stranger that sojourneth with thee, if his wife die, do ye treat him in like manner? Yea, he replied, in like manner, even as thou hast seen. Then I departed from him in grief and mourning lest I should perchance be bereft of my wife. In vain did I say to myself, Be comforted, maybe thou wilt die before her, none knoweth. In vain did I give myself up to my manifold occupations. The fear was not to be dispelled, and within a short time what I had feared came to pass. My wife was stricken with a fever, and when I had reason to hope she would recover, she suddenly relapsed and died. My grief at this was overwhelming, but as if to add to it, there came many to condole with me on her death and to mingle their tears with mine, for that I should soon be departing this life. The king himself came and commiserated with me on my most unhappy fate, and he said, There is no strength nor power in any but God. Farewell, O my son. And they prepared my wife for burial, arraying her in her richest garments and her finest jewels. But when they carried her to the burial place and cast her down into the pit, and all my companions pressed upon me to bid me farewell, my gorge rose, and I cried out upon them that their custom was vile. Loudly I spoke my bitter mind on the abominable nature of this thing. They would not listen, but took me by force and lowered me into the pit, together with the seven cakes and the pitcher of water. And when I had reached the floor of a vast cavern, they called down to me, Untie the ropes that we may draw them up. I answered, Draw me up with them. Nay, nay they replied, we do but follow our custom. To the ravens with you and your custom, I retorted, for I had no stomach for this proceeding. Then, as I steadily refused to loose the ropes, they at last threw them down upon me, and having closed the mouth of the pit, went their way. Now was I in worse plight than I had ever been. On that cavern floor there were the bodies and bleached bones of those that had died a natural death-cheek by jowl, with those who had perished in the fulfilment of this abominable custom. And I said to myself, better to remain single and live than to marry and be buried alive. Nevertheless, knowing not night from day, I kept myself from death by eating sparingly of the cakes and drinking some of the water, for I was in no mood to die in so vile a manner after having come through great perils by mountain and sea. At length, when I had eaten all the cakes and drunk all the water, and hunger and thirst began to cry out within me, I arose and wandered to and fro in the cavern, stumbling and falling over dead bodies and biting the dust of bones that had crumbled long since. By dint of much groping in the dark, I at length found the wall of the cavern, and selecting therein a cavity free from bones and corpses, I stretched myself and slept. I was awakened later, as if by hunger and thirst knocking at the door, and while I sat in gloom thinking of the plenty in Baghdad, fool that I was to leave it, I heard a sudden noise. Looking forth from my cavity, I saw that the stone had been removed from the opening of the cavern, and a dead body was being lowered. It was the body of a man, and after him was let down the living body of his wife. She was weeping and wailing for him, and for herself. Then the mouth of the cavern was closed again, and all was dark and silent, save for the wailing of the woman echoing through the cavern. Alas, she cried, that I should die this lingering death. Had I the means to end my life, then would I do it. Would that there were one here to slay me. When I heard this, I remembered that I had never been able to resist the pleadings of a woman. So I arose, and taking a stout leg-bone in my hand, I slew her according to her desire, and I took her seven cakes and the pitcher of water, which she would no longer need, and retiring to my cavity, I ate and drank. This thing occurred many times during my sojourn in that cavern, for a number of married men and women chanced to die, and though they did not always cry out for me to slay them, I knew their prayer beforehand, and answered it speedily. 
Thus the cakes and the water bequeathed to me stayed my spirit, and I continued to live. Time passed slowly, but yet it passed. I had no other means of measuring it except to call an hour a day and a day a year, and I was weary to death of it all when an unwonted thing occurred. I was awakened suddenly from sleep by a noise at the far end of the cavern. Then I heard footsteps as of some beast. I arose, and arming myself with a stout bone, advanced upon the intruder, but it heard me and fled from me, and I could not come at it. Yet, as I followed its footsteps, I saw its form darken a pinspot of daylight at the end of a crevice of the cavern. This gave me a glimmer of hope, for, where that beast had passed, I myself might pass, and so gain the outer air. Over jagged points of rock I clambered towards that opening, now losing sight of it, and now gaining view of it again, until at last I reached it, and found that it was indeed a communication with the outer country. With some difficulty I forced my way through it, and climbed down by a perilous pathway to the seashore. I had escaped from the sepulchre of the living and the dead, and I praised God for the sight of the sky and the sea. But when I had looked into my position and found behind me an impassable precipice, before me the wide stretching sea, and above me the dome of heaven, I sat down on the shore with my head on my knees and said within myself, There is no way out. I cannot scale the sheer cliff, neither can I tread the fish's pathways in the sea, nor walk in the tracks made by birds in the air. There is no way out. Day followed day, and I strove to stay my hunger with what shellfish I could find, but the supply was meagre, and again and again I was forced to return to the cavern to receive reward of cakes and water in return for merciful death dealt by my hand. Far be it from me to rob the dead, and none can say I did so. It was in the spirit of a last gift generously bestowed by those about to die that chains of pure gold were hung about my neck and rich jewels thrust upon me. These keepsakes of many I retained, assured that later I should carry them with me to a nameless grave in a desolate spot. But God, in his infinite mercy, willed it otherwise, for one day, sitting sadly on the shore as was my wont, I espied a vessel on the sea. Hope surged high within my breast, and I arose and stripped myself of a white garment and mounted it on a staff and ran wildly to and fro, waving it above me. And when my signal was observed, the vessel stayed its course and sent a boat ashore. Who art thou, and what doest thou here? cried one from the boat as it ran upon the beach. Know ye not that this is a desolate coast, and none has ever been seen upon it? And I greeted them with joy and answered them, telling my strange experience in a few words. Then, their wonder strong within them, they took me across to the ship and led me before the master, who marvelled greatly at finding a man where none had ever seen a human being before. He asked me many questions, and when I answered him, giving him the whole history of my adventures as heretofore set down, he was a man bewildered. Raising his eyes to heaven, he said, by Allah, thy case is extraordinary. And all around wondered that a man could experience such things and live. In return for his kindness in rescuing me from my terrible plight, I tendered him some of the rarest jewels I had brought with me from the cavern. But he refused me courteously, saying, Nay, O oh my brother, if we find one in like case with thee, we succor him and give him to eat and drink, and if he be naked, we clothe him. Then, at the first city we reach, we set him on land with some valuable token of our goodwill, for so it is with us of the sea that we are not unmindful of the sufferings of others. And when I heard this, I prayed for him and his family that he and they might live long in health and prosperity. Our journey from that place, where I had suffered so much, took us from island unto island towards the city of El Basra. As we proceeded, the places where we cast anchor grew more and more familiar to me, and, as of old, I bought and sold as merchants do. At length we arrived at the city of El Basra, 
whence, having transacted business there for some days, bartering and selling the jewels I had acquired, I journeyed to Baghdad. There, in the bosom of my family, and surrounded by my companions, I returned to my former habit of life. These, then, were the experiences of my fourth voyage. And, O oh my brother, Sinbad the landsman, if thou wilt honour me by thy presence tomorrow, I will relate to thee still stranger things that befell me in my fifth voyage. The Fifth Voyage of Sinbad The Sailor Looking back from the position of safety and comfort to which I had returned, I came in time to make light of the perils I had encountered and the sufferings I had endured. The advantages that had come to me through these perils and sufferings now stood in the foreground of my thoughts, and I said within myself, It is the life for a man, for how otherwise can he come at the meaning of the great book of the world than by treading its pages? And moreover, I had conceived the wish to become the owner of a ship, for thus the gain accruing from a voyage to other lands would be so much greater. Having considered the matter deeply, I arose from my life of luxury and ease, and departed with many baileys of merchandise for the city of El Basra. There in the river I found at length a splendid vessel which I purchased. I found a master and a crew over whom I set my own trusty servants, and having secured a goodly company of merchants as passengers, I embarked their bales and mine, and we set sail. We worked our way outwards, calling at island after island, and doing the usual business that merchants find in those places, until one day we came to a large uninhabited island. Here, while I was engaged in matters concerning the vessel, the merchants landed, and as I afterwards learned, they found there the great egg of a rook, such as I had met with on a former voyage. Mistaking it for a deserted structure, and failing to find an entrance, they had amused themselves by casting stones at it, so that it broke, whereupon a young rook came forth from the shell. And they set upon this monstrous chicken in its helpless condition, and slew it, and brought great slabs of its flesh back to the ship. When I heard what they had done, I was sore afraid, and reproached them for their rash action. For look you, I said, there is not a doubt the mother rook will seek to revenge the loss of her young, and seeing our ship will attribute the deed to us, and attack us, and destroy us. But they neither heeded my warning, nor repented them of their rash action. The vengeance of the rook was sudden and dire. Scarce had I spoken when the sun was obscured from our sight, and looking up, we beheld the gigantic bird descending upon the island. When it saw that its egg had been broken, and its young one destroyed, it flew above us, looking down at the ship and shrieking in a voice that filled the sky. On this it was joined by its mate, and the two circled round us, their hoarse cries of rage falling like thunder on the sea. In great fear I bade the master and the sailors hoist the sails and seek safety in flight. Then, as soon as we began to draw off from the island, the rooks left us and flew inland, so that we thought we had made good our escape. But soon they reappeared and came after us, each bearing in its talons a huge mass of rock. One of them flew above us and dropped the rock, so that we saw death descending upon us. But the great mass missed the ship by a narrow space, and falling close astern, raised such a commotion of waves that the ship was flung up on a mountain of water and then hurled down against the bottom of the sea before little by little she came to rest on the level tide. Then the other rook dropped the rock from its talons, and fate ordained that it struck the ship astern with a mighty crash. Amid cries of fear and despair we sank into the sea, and all seemed lost. How I survived the shock and turmoil of that sudden shipwreck I cannot describe clearly, for I was like one stunned or wrenched from his mind apart. How I sought to save myself is gone from me by reason of the extreme peril. I can imagine only that I touched some wreckage and clung to it, for when my mind returned to me I found myself on the shore of an island sitting upon a plank, which, it seemed, had borne me hither. That I had fought against wind and wave I knew, 
for I was well nigh exhausted. I could do nothing more than drag myself painfully to a sheltered spot where I rested and slept. When I arose later in the day, I was refreshed, and having found both fruit and water, I ate and drank, and my strength returned to me. I went forth upon the island, and to and fro in it, but I found no other's footprint on the shore, nor any sign of human habitation from coast to coast, but that there was a dweller there I was soon to learn, and to my cost. It was on the following day towards evening, when I was walking among the trees, that I came upon an old man sitting on the bank of a stream. He was a comely old man, with flowing silver locks and an ample white beard. He was clothed from the waist downward with the leaves of trees threaded together. As I regarded him for some moments, I felt that his whole aspect betokened a disposition of simplicity and mild benevolence. Advancing upon the bank, I spoke to him, but he shook his head sadly and sighed, and I saw that his speech was gone. Then he made signs with his hands as if to say, Mount me upon thy neck and carry me across the stream. I felt kindly disposed towards this mild and gentle old man and wished to do him a service, so I mounted him upon my neck and took him across the stream. Now, I said, thou canst dismount when it pleaseth thee. But instead of dismounting, he wound his legs still more closely round my neck and pressed his feet into my chest so that I cried out with pain and rage and attempted to throw him from my shoulders. But my frantic efforts were in vain. He stuck like a leash, and I could not dislodge him. Indeed, he clung so tight that he nearly throttled me, and I fell to the ground exhausted. Then he belaboured me sorely with his feet until I arose with him again, and in this way he compelled me to obey him. When he would go in among the trees, he made a sign with his hand, and if I obeyed not with alacrity, he beat me with his feet unmercifully. By reason of his behaviour, I was at last compelled to cancel my first opinion of him, and though he cleaved to me night and day, we were by no means friends. I was his captive, and he ceased not to remind me of it. If I dallied by the way, or stumbled, his hard feet would rain blows upon me, and at night, when he slept with his legs wound tightly round my neck, he would often dream that I had disobeyed him, and would beat me violently with his feet and hands. For many, many days I was ridden hither and hither at the will of this obstinate old fellow, who, though he could not torment me with speech, was truculent enough in his manner. And I reproached myself for having desired to do him a service, saying constantly in my mind, By Allah, never again, while living, will I do a service to any. At length one day the old man guided and belaboured me into a space on the island where pumpkins grew in abundance. While he was eating some of these, I took others that were ripe, and having cleaned out the seeds and coarse matter through a small aperture, filled them with the juice of grapes. Then I filled up the apertures and laid the pumpkins in the sun. Thus, in a few days, I procured pure wine, and every day thereafter, while the old man on my neck ate of the pumpkins, I drank of the wine until I became intoxicated, and laughed and sang and danced about with him among the trees. And when, with fist and heel, he desired to know the cause of this, I showed him the wine that I had made. Seeing that its effect upon me was so agreeable, he sought to achieve the same happy result by drinking largely of it himself, so that he grew hilarious and broke a pumpkin over my head, rocking and rolling in his seat with laughter. Then, as he continued to drink, he gradually lost control of his limbs and lolled from side to side whereupon I grasped his feet and unwound them from my neck and threw him on the ground. And so at last, to rid the earth of such a monster, I slew him and left him there for the vultures. After this, happiness returned to me, and I went about the island like one relieved of a heavy burden, as indeed I had been. And day by day I sat by the sea watching for a vessel, but I lived upon the island many days before, at last I saw a ship approach and cast anchor off the shore. When the passengers had landed, I ran towards them and welcomed them, answering their many questions respecting my condition. They listened to my story with great amazement. Then someone said, 
This old man of whom thou speakest is surely he whom they call the old man of the sea. He hath ridden many to death, and none hath escaped but thee. Therefore praise God for thy deliverance. They took me to the ship and set food before me, and after I had eaten they brought me some clean clothes, and I clad myself decently. As the ship set sail for El Basra, my thoughts went before it to Baghdad, the abode of peace. But I was destined to mischance, for a strange thing befell me. We had journeyed but a few days when we came to an island, whereon was a city with lofty spires and splendid houses. This was the city of apes, of which I had heard that at night time the people, fearing the apes, put out in boats upon the sea, so to sleep in safety. I landed on this island with some companions, and in our going about the city I missed them. While I was searching everywhere, they must have returned to the ship, thinking I had preceded them, for when I reached the shore later the vessel had gone. I reproached myself for this mishap, for I had already suffered once at the hands of the apes. So I sat on the seashore bemoaning my fate. While I was doing this, one of the people of the city came to me and inquired as to my trouble, and I told him. Then come with us in our boat, he said, for the night is falling, and if thou remain in the city, the apes will devour thee. So I went with them, and we pushed off together with a multitude of other boats until we rested about a mile from the shore, and there we remained and slept till the morning, when everyone returned to the city and went about his occupation and in like manner as the inhabitants sleep upon the sea by night and dwell in the city by day, so the apes infest the city by night and sleep in the forests by day. Woe betide any remaining in that city after the sun goes down, for he will of a certainty be torn limb from limb and devoured. I earned my bread in that island in a strange manner and was able to set by a small store of gold. It was in this way. I observed many of the people gathering pebbles on the shore and placing them in bags, and when they had collected a sufficient quantity, they went forth into a valley filled with lofty trees. Here slept the apes among the branches, for the trees were so high that none but an ape could climb them. It was the way of the people then to pelt the apes with the pebbles, whereupon they awoke screaming and chattering and plucked the fruit from the trees and hurled it down at their tormentors and I saw that the fruit was the coconut. When a sufficient number of these nuts had been secured, the people gathered them up and returned to the city, where they sold them. Very soon I too was gathering pebbles and pelting the apes in the trees, and in this way I amassed a great store of coconuts. These I sold and bought merchandise and traded and prospered in the city. In this way I continued for a long time until at last I took to buying coconuts from the people and storing them against the arrival of a ship when I hoped to sell them in bulk. At length a large vessel anchored off the island, and I bargained with the merchants thereon. They agreed with me upon a good price for my store. With the money thus obtained I bought more of the merchandise of the place and embarked it on the ship. Then, bidding farewell to my companions in the city, I took my departure. The ship was bound for El Basra, but on the voyage we lingered to visit many islands that I had not seen before. Upon one we found an abundance of cinnamon and pepper, and here I noted a peculiar thing. On every bunch of pepper was a large leaf that hung down when the sun shone, but when it rained this leaf twisted and erected itself above the tendrils to shield them. And this is truth. So we sailed onwards past the islands of the Aloes Wood, where the people are depraved and know not the call to prayer, until we came at length to the island of pearls. Here I gave some coconuts to the divers, saying, Dive for me for luck. And they dived in the sea and returned to the surface with pearls of great size, which they gave to me, assuring me that my fortune was of the best. So that when we reached El Basra I was rich with pearls and merchandise some of which I sold there, and some here in Baghdad. Once more in the lap of luxury, and reposing in the bosom of my family, I returned to my former life of revelry and ease, and soon forgot the hardships I had endured. And this is the whole story of my fifth voyage. 
Return tomorrow, O Sinbad, the landsman, and thou shalt hear from me the adventures of my sixth voyage, for they are even yet more wonderful. The Sixth Voyage of Sinbad the Sailor On a day when I was living happily in Baghdad, having forgotten the perils and dangers of my former voyages, I was sitting at ease in my garden when a party of merchants came to me, and their tales of travel aroused within my bosom a great longing to engage again in the hazardous delights of those things. I pondered long upon the matter, and though I had said within myself, Never will I set forth again, I found that my mind was made up in spite of me. Therefore I set about collecting merchandise, and having packed a goodly number of bales, I departed for El Basra, where I took ship with a company of merchants and others of high repute. The outward voyage was pleasant and fortunate, and we did as others do, buying and selling and amusing ourselves in different cities. But there came a day of disaster, when the master of the ship suddenly discovered that we had wandered from our course and had lost our reckoning. He plucked his beard and smote his breast, and cried out in despair that we had sailed into an unknown sea where dire perils awaited us. And so it proved, for not long afterwards, while we were sailing in a calm sea, a sudden wind burst upon us, and before the sails could be loosed, the rudder was broken, and the ship drifted, and was driven at last upon the sides of a high mountain rising up to heaven. She was dashed to pieces by the violence of the waves, and from that terrible wreck few survived. There were some others besides myself who clung to the sides of the mountain, and by tooth and nail climbed to a place of safety. Little by little, when the tide receded, we made our way down among the crags until we came to a strip of seashore and from this point we could see that the island was of large size, its interior being sheltered from storms by the front of the mountain. But what took our wonder was this. On the seashore was amassed the wealth of a thousand wrecks, scattered here, there, and everywhere, in foam and high dry, were flotsam and jetsam of richest merchandise, much of it spoiled by the sea, but much more cast high up and still of great value. All along the shore were planks and fragments of many vessels that had been wrecked on this inhospitable coast. And this was not all, for when we proceeded through the island, we found a spring of pure ambergris overflowing into the sea, and by this the whales are attracted. But when they have swallowed it and dived to the depths of the sea, it turns in their stomachs, and they eject it, so that it rises to the surface in solid lumps such as are found by sailors. But the ambergris that is cast about the opening of the spring melts in the heat of the sun, and its perfume is blown about the island, wafted sweet upon the breeze like fragrant musk. When we had explored the island and wondered at the many strange things it contained, we searched among the wreckage on the shore and found some few barrels of preserved meat, and on these we stayed our hunger. With the provisions on the shore and the fruit we secured on the island, we were in no danger of starvation, but a kind of fever seized upon our company, and one after another sickened and died. This was a time of stress and despair. Day after day the living buried the dead, until there was only one left, and that one was I. And I wept and waited, and as if death would not come uninvited, I arose and dug myself a grave in readiness, for there was none left to bury me when I died. It was on the seashore that I made my grave, so that, when I should come to lie in it in my last moments, the wind should blow the sand upon me and bury me. And in this state of mind I blamed myself for setting out on this voyage in disregard of the lessons learned from former perils. But God in his mercy led my footsteps forth, and I roamed in the island restless for the end. In my wanderings I came to a river gushing forth out of the side of a mountain, and after flowing for a space between banks of verdure in a valley, entering again another mountain. Having followed it to this point, I sat down upon a bank against the mountain wall and pondered, and I said within myself, This river flowing through caverns within the mountain must have an opening somewhere, perchance in a fertile country where people dwell. 
For a long time, I turned the chances of this within my mind, and at last decided to build a raft and commit myself upon it to the current. For at most, it were better to die that way than in my present desolation. By means of ropes and wreckage from the seashore, my raft was soon constructed, and in its construction I omitted not to measure it according to the width of the river. Then, full of a wild hope that I might at length reach an inhabited region, I stowed upon it rich goods from the shore, ambergras from the spring, and the rarest jewels I could find in the beds of the watercourses. As I set myself upon the raft and launched it, I said, If I perish, I perish, but if I come to the haunts of men, I come to them rich in precious things. No sooner had I entered into the aperture of the mountain than I was suddenly encased in darkness, and having no choice which way I went, flung myself flat on the raft, lest my head should be shattered against the roof of the tunnel. Like this I floated on, sometimes feeling there was a wide space around me, and sometimes clinging to the raft, lest some narrowing of the passage should sweep me to destruction. And all this time my terror was so acute that at last I swooned and lay face downward on the raft, the plaything of fate and the sport of the rushing current. When I awoke, I found myself in the open air. The sun was shining above, and the birds were singing in the trees around me. I was still lying on the raft, which was tied to a stake on the shore of a beautiful lake. As soon as I had raised myself and looked about me, a number of dark-skinned people gathered round and questioned me in an unknown tongue, but I shook my head, understanding nothing of what they said. At last, one advanced from among them, and addressing me in Arabic said, Peace be with thee, brother. Then I seized him joyfully by the hand and greeted him, but I was weary and hungry and could give no account of myself because of my utter exhaustion. Seeing my state, he called for food and wine, and they hastened to set them before me. When I had eaten and drunk, and my strength had returned to me, I told what I had come through, and the one who had addressed me in Arabic interpreted it to the others. They were filled with wonder at my story, and insisted that I should accompany them to their king, and acquaint him with the history of my strange adventure. So they took me, with the raft and all the riches I had laid upon it, and led me before their king, and from his state and magnificence I knew that I beheld the king of Serendib, whose name and power and learning are known through all the earth. He saluted me in the custom of my own people, addressing me in Arabic which fell easily from his tongue. This set me at my ease, and I told him my story, to which he listened with great attention. When I had finished, he raised his hand and said, By Allah! Thou hast endured much, and thy case is extraordinary. Thou art greatly favoured by fate, wherefore I join my happiness with thine at thy deliverance and safety. I was greatly moved at his words, and begging his acceptance of a gift at my hands, I took the rarest jewels from the raft, together with a quantity of ambergris and aloe wood, and laid them at his feet. He graciously accepted my present, and immediately established me in a position of honour, bidding me dwell with him in his palace. I accepted his hospitality and remained in his land in great happiness and honour, associating with the grandees and the people of rank. And I said to myself, I care not if the rest of my days are passed in this kingdom of splendour and magnificence. It was indeed a land of wealth and abundance, and there the day is equally divided with the night the whole year round, and when the sun rises, Light bursts suddenly upon the earth, and when it sets, the darkness descends like a curtain that is loosed. There is a lofty mountain whose glittering streams contain the richest jewels with rare minerals, and everywhere, on hill and valley, are wafted the fragrant odours of spices. The delights of this realm held me enthralled for a long time, so that I forgot my own country, wherein is the abode of peace. But on a day when I ascended the high mountain and looked far out across the sea, I seemed to hear the voice of my own land calling to me. Then, with that far call still in my ears, I went in to the king and asked him to let me go. At first he demurred and tried to induce me to remain with him and his people, but, 
When I pressed for his permission, he relented and gave me a large sum of money for my journey, and also many gifts. When I was about to depart, the king called me to him and handed me a letter written on fine parchment. This he asked me to give into the hands of the caliph, Harun er Rashid. The substance of the letter was this. The king of Sarandib sends greeting. Peace be on thee, O brother, from the king of Sarandib, who commands a thousand elephants, and in whose palace are ten thousand jewels. By the bearer of this we send thee a gift, for we have a deep affection for thee. The gift is all too trifling, but we beseech thee to accept it graciously and reply to us. Peace be upon thee. The present with which I was entrusted was a goblet of ruby, the inside of which was set with sparkling diamonds and priceless pearls, truly a kingly gift. Having bade farewell to the king and such of his people that I had associated with, I embarked in a large ship which was bound for El Basra. In good time we reached that port, and I journeyed up the river to Baghdad. My first thought was to deliver the letter and the gift into the hands of the Khalifa, so I lost no time in approaching him and fulfilling my pledge to the king of Sarandib. He was greatly pleased with the letter, and when he saw the sparkling goblet of ruby and precious stones, he was filled with delight. O oh, Sinbad, he said, this king must be exceedingly wealthy and powerful. What sayest thou? And I told him of the wonder and magnificence of the land of Sarandib, how the king's seat of state is on a splendid throne placed upon a gigantic elephant with his courtiers and officials standing about him on a richly decorated platform. How there are, around his majesty, a thousand other elephants on which sit the princes of the land, and surrounding all on every hand ten thousand horsemen clad in silk and gold, and how a crier goes before the king exalting him to heaven, and another behind him proclaiming, Great is he! but he will die. Again, again, and again, I say it. He will die. And as I continued to tell of these things, the caliph marveled greatly at the wisdom and power of this king. Report hath spoken truly, he said. As thou hast witnessed to me, O Sinbad, the tales of his might and dominion have exaggerated nothing. He then thanked me for my faithful service and bestowed rich gifts upon me, and bade me seek my own house in peace and content. There in the bosom of my family I lived at ease, having put behind me the perils of travel and set fixedly before me the determination never to seek them again. Yet, O Sinbad the landsman, my determination was overruled by the direct command of the Khalifa, and if thou wilt honour me by thy presence again tomorrow, I will relate to thee the events of my seventh and last voyage. The Seventh Voyage of Sinbad the Sailor In adhering to my vow never again to fare forth from my native land in search of strange wonders at the risk of deadly peril, I was contented and happy in my state. While I was sitting one day thinking on this, and saying within myself, I am here in the abode of peace, and Allah be praised. I shall never quit it for the haunts of trouble. Lo, there came a messenger summoning me to the Khalifa. I arose and followed him, and presently I was before his majesty, saluting him and kissing the ground. Welcome, O Sindbad, he said. Know that I have a matter of importance for thee to execute. Sire, I answered, I am thy slave. Then the Khalifa unfolded to me his wish which was that I should go to the king of Sarandib, bearing a letter and a gift. By Allah, I cried when I heard this. O oh my lord, be not displeased, but have I not already taken a vow that I will not go forth again upon the sea, lest I suffer worse things than have already befallen me? The bare mention of a voyage causes my knees to shake, and I repeated to him the terrible sufferings and perils I had encountered in my travels whereupon the Khalife raised his hands and said no man had endured worse things. Nevertheless, he added, smiling upon me, thou wilt go forth once more for my sake, and thou wilt bear my letter and gift to the king of Sarandib. It was not for me to disobey the command of the prince of the faithful, and I bowed my head in submission. 
I took from his hands the account of the items composing the gift, together with a letter and a sum of money for my expenses, and, bidding him farewell, went forth, saying to myself that fate was against me. The Caliph's gift to the King of Sarandib was one of great magnificence. First, there was a splendid white horse, the equal of which was not to be found in the length and breadth of Arabia. Its saddle and trappings were adorned with gold and set with brilliant jewels. Then, in addition to this, there were a priceless robe, fit for the king of all the earth, a great quantity of rich stuffs from Egypt and Greece, and a wonderful crystal goblet of such a kind that a man's whole lifetime would be required to make it. And the caliphate's letter ran as follows. Peace be on thee from the king er Rashid, highest in any land but thine, under God, whose name be exalted. We rejoiced greatly at thy letter, and we have sent thee some royal trifles, thy gracious acceptance of which will give us joy and happiness. Peace be with thee. With all these things I embarked upon a large vessel, and set sail from El Basra with a company of merchants. We journeyed for long days and nights, until at length we came to the island of Sarandib. There I went into the king in his palace, and he gave me a joyous welcome. By Allah, he said, we have often thought of thee, O Sinbad, and now we rejoice to see thy face again. Then he bade me sit beside him, and asked with courtesy the reason of my visit. I informed him and told him of the caliph's gift, handing him the letter. When he had read it, he was overjoyed, and when at length he saw the gift and the richness of it, he marvelled greatly, and conferred upon me all the honours befitting the ambassador of the Prince of the Faithful. After some days of pleasure and happiness in his land, I made known to him my desire to depart speedily to my own country, but it was with difficulty that I obtained his permission. At last he allowed me to go, bearing friendly messages to the Khalifa, and I set sail for my own land, glad that I was now free to return to the life to which I had vowed myself. But, O oh Sindbad the landsman, the chances of long voyages upon the sea are such as thou knowest not of. We had not been many days on our course when, as we were passing near an island, a fleet of boats put off from the shore and surrounded us. They were manned by a host of men clad in suits of mail. They looked more like demons than men, and were armed with swords and daggers. They drew in on us and attacked us, slaying those who offered resistance and taking the rest prisoners. They towed the ship to the island and took all the merchandise in the hold. Then they led us away to be sold as slaves. It fell to my lot that I was purchased by a rich man of gentle mien. He took me to his house, gave me food and drink, clothed me well, and treated me in a friendly fashion. Somewhat comforted, I rested, giving my hands to light tasks about his house. After some days he called me to him and said, Art thou skilled in any art or trade? I answered him that I was a merchant, and was skilled only in the art of buying and selling. Canst thou not use the bow? he asked. Now I was skilled in archery, and I offered to give him proof in the matter. He then placed a bow and arrow in my hands, and I pierced a mark at fifty paces. It is well, he said, thou art skilled. The next day he sat me behind him on an elephant, and at nightfall we journeyed to a place where there were some high trees. One of these he bade me climb and sit there with arrow on bowstring till the elephants came at dawn, when I was to shoot, and if I was so fortunate as to kill one, I was to run to him in all haste and inform him of it. He then went away on his elephant, leaving me in the tree full of terror. When at last the sun rose, a great number of elephants came straying about among the trees, and when one came beneath mine, I sent my arrows at him. Late in the morning, a well-aimed shaft pierced the brain of a monstrous beast, and with loud roarings, he fell and died. At evening time, when the other elephants had retired from the spot, I descended from the tree and ran with all haste to my master, who rejoiced at my news and sent his slaves to bring the beast in. Day after day I continued at this sport, each day securing at least one elephant. 
But a day came when trouble gathered round that tree in which I sat. It appeared in the form of countless elephants of large size and ferocious aspect. One who seemed to be king among them led the others to my tree. After he had thundered round it many times until the whole world trembled, he made a dash at it, and winding his trunk round it, tore it up by the roots and threw it down. When, half stunned, I found my way out from among the broken branches, the great elephant came upon me bellowing loudly, and seizing me with his trunk, bore me aloft. In this manner he led the whole herd of elephants in a wild stampede that made the earth shake, and they ceased not in their career until they came to a valley in which were a great number of elephants' bones and teeth and tusks. On a heap of these the king elephant set me down very gently, and after that he and the others turned and walked away, leaving me there. I looked about in the valley and saw a wealth of gleaming white tusks on every hand, and I said within myself, The elephants liked not the death of one of their number every day, and they have done this to show how I may come by an abundance of tusks without further slaughter. Then I found my way back over a great distance to the abode of my master. He welcomed me as one returned from the dead, for when he had found the tree torn up by the roots, he had concluded that the elephants had made an end of me. I told him what had befallen me and described the position of the valley where the tusks lay. When he heard this, he was greatly excited and lost no time in mounting me behind him on an elephant and setting forth to find the spot where so much wealth was stored. We reached the valley without mishap, and I showed my master the ivory at sight of which his joy knew no bounds. We then laded the elephant with as much as he could carry and returned with it to the house. This adventure of mine placed me in a most favourable light in my master's eyes, and because I had been the means of revealing to him a source of enormous wealth, he set me free and gave me permission to return to my own country. He was even better than his word, for not many days later he set me on board a vessel bound for El Basra and presented me with a large sum of money for my passage and expenses, together with many bales of merchandise. And my return journey was very fortunate. The traffic I did at the different cities on the way brought me great profit, and I bought many rare things suitable for gifts. On my arrival at Baghdad, I went into the Caliphe and told him all that had befallen me, and he was so astonished thereat, and so delighted at my return, that he commanded his scribes to write my story in letters of gold. And he said to me, O Sinbad, my son, thou hast done well, and now thou shalt have the wish of thine heart, and keep thy vow, for unless thou so desirest, thou shalt go forth no more upon the sea. This, O Sinbad the landsman, is the end of the story of my voyages, and now, as I have conceived an affection for thee, thou shalt dwell with me and be my boon companion, and we shall pass our lives together in a state of the utmost joy and happiness, strengthened by God, whose name be exalted, the great, the omnipotent creator of sea and land.